A privateer is a private person or ship that engages in maritime warfare under a commission of war. The commission, also known as a letter of mark, empowers the person to carry on all forms of hostility permissible at sea by the usages of war, including attacking foreign vessels during wartime and taking them as prizes. Historically, captured ships were subject to condemnation and sale under prize law, with the proceeds divided between the privateer sponsors, shipowners, captains and crew. A percentage share usually went to the issuer of the commission. Since robbery under arms was once common to seaborne trade, all merchant ships were already armed. During war, naval resources were auxiliary to operations on land so privateering was a way of subsidizing state power by mobilizing armed ships and sailors. In practice the legality and status of privateers historically has often been vague. Depending on the specific government and the time period, letters of mark might be issued hastily and or the privateers might take actions beyond what was authorized by the letters. The privateers themselves were often simply pirates who would take advantage of wars between nations to gain semi-legal status for their enterprises. By the end of the 19th century the practice of issuing letters of mark had fallen out of favor because of the chaos it caused and its role in inadvertently encouraging piracy. A privateer is similar to a mercenary except that, whereas a mercenary group receives a set fee for services and generally has a formal reporting structure within the entity that hires them, a privateer acts independently with generally no compensation unless the enemy's property is captured. Legal framework The letter of mark of a privateer would typically limit activity to one particular ship, and specified officers. Typically, the owners or captain would be required to post a performance bond. In the United Kingdom, letters of mark were revoked for various offences. Some crews were treated as harshly as naval crews of the time, while others followed the comparatively relaxed rules of merchant ships. Some crews were made up of professional merchant seamen, others of pirates, debtors, and convicts. Some privateers ended up becoming pirates, not just in the eyes of their enemies but also of their own nations. William Kidd, for instance, began as a legitimate British privateer but was later hanged for piracy. <laughs> Noted privateers Privateers who were considered legitimate by their governments include Francis Drake England, Peter van der Des, Dutch Empire, Amaro Pargo, Spanish Empire or Hispanic Monarchy, Herodine Barbarossa, Ottoman Empire, Robert Surkoff, France, Lars Gathenjelm, Sweden. Topic: Ships. Entrepreneurs converted many different types of vessels into privateers, including obsolete warships and refitted merchant ships. The investors would arm the vessels and recruit large crews, much larger than a merchantman or a naval vessel would carry, in order to crew the prizes they captured. 
privateers generally cruised independently, but it was not unknown for them to form squadrons, or to cooperate with the regular navy. A number of privateers were part of the English fleet that opposed the Spanish Armada in 1588. Privateers generally avoided encounters with warships, as such encounters would be at best unprofitable. Still, such encounters did occur. For instance, in 1815 Chaucer encountered HMS St. Lawrence, herself a former American privateer, mistaking her for a merchantman until too late. In this instance, however, the privateer prevailed. The United States used mixed squadrons of frigates and privateers in the American Revolutionary War. Following the French Revolution, French privateers became a menace to British and American shipping in the Western Atlantic and the Caribbean, resulting in the Quasi-War, a brief conflict between France and the United States, fought largely at sea, and to the Royal Navy's procuring Bermuda sloops to combat the French privateers. Topic. Overall history The practice dated to at least the 13th century but the word itself was coined sometime in the mid-17th century. England, and later the United Kingdom, used privateers to great effect and suffered much from other nations privateering. During the 15th century piracy became an increasing problem and merchant communities such as Bristol began to resort to self-help, arming and equipping ships at their own expense to protect commerce. These privately owned merchant ships, licensed by the Crown, could legitimately take vessels that were deemed pirates. This constituted a revolution in naval strategy," and helped fill the need for protection that the current administration was unable to provide as it "...lacked an institutional structure and coordinated finance." The increase in competition for crews on armed merchant vessels and privateers was due, in a large part, because of the chance for a considerable payoff. Whereas a seaman who shipped on a naval vessel was paid a wage and provided with victuals, the mariner on a merchantman or privateer was paid with an agreed share of the takings. This proved to be a far more attractive prospect, and privateering flourished as a result. During Queen Elizabeth's reign, she encouraged the development of this supplementary navy. Over the course of her rule, she had allowed Anglo-Spanish relations to deteriorate, to the point where one could argue that a war with the Spanish was inevitable. By using privateers, if the Spanish were to take offense at the plundering of their ships, Queen Elizabeth could always deny she had anything to do with the actions of such independents. Some of the most famous privateers that later fought in the Anglo-Spanish War 1585 included the Sea Dogs. In the late 16th century, English ships cruised in the Caribbean and off the coast of Spain, trying to intercept treasure fleets from the Spanish main. At this early stage the idea of a regular navy the Royal Navy, as distinct from the Merchant Navy was not present, so there is little to distinguish the activity of English privateers from regular naval warfare. 
Attacking Spanish ships, even during peacetime, was part of a policy of military and economic competition with Spain, which had been monopolizing the maritime trade routes along with the Portuguese helping to provoke the First Anglo-Spanish War. Capturing a Spanish treasure ship would enrich the crown as well as strike a practical blow against Spanish domination of America. Piet Pieterzoon Hein was a brilliantly successful Dutch privateer who captured a Spanish treasure fleet. Magnus Heinesen was another privateer who served the Dutch against the Spanish. While their and others' attacks brought home a great deal of money, they hardly dented the flow of gold and silver from Mexico to Spain. Elizabeth was succeeded by the first Stuart monarchs, James I and Charles I, who did not permit privateering. There were a number of unilateral and bilateral declarations limiting privateering between 1785 and 1823. However, the breakthrough came in 1856 when the Declaration of Paris, signed by all major European powers, stated that, "...privateering is and remains abolished." The U.S. did not sign because a stronger amendment, protecting all private property from capture at sea, was not accepted. In the 19th century many nations passed laws forbidding their nationals from accepting commissions as privateers for other nations. The last major power to flirt with privateering was Prussia in the 1870 Franco-Prussian War, when Prussia announced the creation of a «volunteer navy» of ships privately owned and manned and eligible for prize money. The only difference between this and privateering was that these volunteer ships were under the discipline of the regular navy. Topic: 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. Privateers were a large part of the total military force at sea during the 17th and 18th centuries. In the First Anglo-Dutch War, English privateers attacked the trade on which the United Provinces entirely depended, capturing over 1,000 Dutch merchant ships. During the subsequent war with Spain, Spanish and Flemish privateers in the service of the Spanish crown, including the Dunkirkers, captured 1,500 English merchant ships, helping to restore Dutch international trade. British trade, whether coastal, Atlantic, or Mediterranean, was also attacked by Dutch privateers and others in the Second and Third Anglo-Dutch Wars. During King George's War, approximately 36,000 Americans served aboard privateers at one time or another. During the Nine Years' War, the French adopted a policy of strongly encouraging privateers, including the famous Jean Bart, to attack English and Dutch shipping. England lost roughly 4,000 merchant ships during the war. In the following War of Spanish Succession, privateer attacks continued, Britain losing 3,250 merchant ships. Parliament passed an updated Cruisers and Convoys Act in 1708 allocating regular warships to the defence of trade. In the subsequent conflict, the War of Austrian Succession, the Royal Navy was able to concentrate more on defending British ships. Britain lost 3,238 merchantmen, a smaller fraction of her merchant marine than the enemy losses of 3,434. 
while French losses were proportionally severe, the smaller but better protected Spanish trade suffered the least and it was Spanish privateers who enjoyed much of the best Allied plunder of British trade, particularly in the West Indies. During the American Civil War privateering took on several forms, including blockade running while privateering in general occurred in the interests of both the North and the South. Letters of mark would often be issued to private shipping companies and other private owners of ships, authorizing them to engage vessels deemed to be unfriendly to the issuing government. Crews of ships were awarded the cargo and other prizes aboard any captured vessel as an incentive to search far and wide for ships attempting to supply the Confederacy, or aid the Union, as the case may be. <laughs> Britain England and Scotland practiced privateering both separately and together after they united to create the Kingdom of Great Britain in 1707. It was a way to gain for themselves some of the wealth the Spanish and Portuguese were taking from the New World before beginning their own transatlantic settlement, and a way to assert naval power before a strong Royal Navy emerged. Sir Andrew Barton, Lord High Admiral of Scotland, followed the example of his father, who had been issued with letters of mark by James III of Scotland to prey upon English and Portuguese shipping in 1485. The letters in due course were reissued to the son. Barton was killed following an encounter with the English in 1511. Sir Francis Drake, who had close contact with the Sovereign, was responsible for some damage to Spanish shipping, as well as attacks on Spanish settlements in the Americas in the 16th century. He participated in the successful English defence against the Spanish Armada in 1588, though he was also partly responsible for the failure of the English Armada against Spain in 1589. Sir George Clifford, 3rd Earl of Cumberland, was a successful privateer against Spanish shipping in the Caribbean. He is also famous for his short-lived 1598 capture of Fort San Felipe del Moro, the citadel protecting San Juan, Puerto Rico. He arrived in Puerto Rico on June 15, 1598, but by November of that year Clifford and his men had fled the island due to fierce civilian resistance. He gained sufficient prestige from his naval exploits to be named the official champion of Queen Elizabeth I. Clifford became extremely wealthy through his buccaneering, but lost most of his money gambling on horse races. Captain Christopher Newport led more attacks on Spanish shipping and settlements than any other English privateer. As a young man, Newport sailed with Sir Francis Drake in the attack on the Spanish fleet at Cadiz and participated in England's defeat of the Spanish Armada. During the war with Spain, Newport seized fortunes of Spanish and Portuguese treasure in fierce sea battles in the West Indies as a privateer for Queen Elizabeth I. He lost an arm whilst capturing a Spanish ship during an expedition in 1590, but despite this he continued on privateering, successfully blockading western Cuba the following year. In 1592, Newport captured the Portuguese Carrick Madre de Deus Mother of God, valued at £500,000. Sir Henry Morgan was a successful privateer. 
Operating out of Jamaica, he carried on a war against Spanish interests in the region, often using cunning tactics. His operation was prone to cruelty against those he captured, including torture to gain information about booty, and in one case using priests as human shields. Despite reproaches for some of his excesses, he was generally protected by Sir Thomas Modiford, the governor of Jamaica. He took an enormous amount of booty, as well as landing his privateers ashore and attacking land fortifications, including the sack of the city of Panama with only 1,400 crew. Other British privateers of note include Fortunatus Wright, Edward Collier, Sir John Hawkins, his son Sir Richard Hawkins, Michael Gear, and Sir Christopher Mings. Notable British colonial privateers in Nova Scotia include Alexander Godfrey of the Brig Rover and Joseph Barse of the schooner Liverpool Packet. The latter schooner captured over 50 American vessels during the War of 1812. <inaudible> Bermudians The English colony of Bermuda or the Summers Isles, settled accidentally in 1609, was used as a base for English privateers from the time it officially became part of the territory of the Virginia Company in 1612, especially by ships belonging to the Earl of Warwick, for whom Bermuda's Warwick Parish is named the Warwick name had long been associated with commerce raiding, as exampled by the Newport ship, thought to have been taken from the Spanish by Warwick the Kingmaker in the 15th century. Many Bermudians were employed as crew aboard privateers throughout the century, although the colony was primarily devoted to farming cash crops until turning from its failed agricultural economy to the sea after the 1684 dissolution of the Summers Isles Company, a spin-off of the Virginia Company which had overseen the colony since 1615. With a total area of 54 square kilometers, 21 square miles, and lacking any natural resources other than the Bermuda cedar, the colonists applied themselves fully to the maritime trades, developing the speedy Bermuda sloop, which was well suited both to commerce and to commerce raiding. Bermudian merchant vessels turned to privateering at every opportunity in the 18th century, preying on the shipping of Spain, France, and other nations during a series of wars, including, the 1688-1697 Nine Years' War King William's War, the 1702-1713 Queen Anne's War, the 1739-1748 War of Jenkins' Ear, the 1740-1748 War of the Austrian Succession King George's War, the 1754-1763 Seven Years' War known in the United States as the French and Indian War, this conflict was devastating for the colony's merchant fleet. Fifteen privateers operated from Bermuda during the war, but losses exceeded captures. The 1775-1783 American War of Independence, and the 1796-1808 Anglo-Spanish War. By the middle of the 18th century, Bermuda was sending twice as many privateers to sea as any of the continental colonies. They typically left Bermuda with very large crews. This advantage in manpower was vital in overpowering the crews of larger vessels, which themselves often lacked sufficient crewmembers to put up a strong defense. 
The extra crewmen were also useful as prize crews for returning captured vessels. The Bahamas, which had been depopulated of its indigenous inhabitants by the Spanish, had been settled by England, beginning with the Eleutheran adventurers, dissident Puritans driven out of Bermuda during the English Civil War. Spanish and French attacks destroyed New Providence in 1703, creating a stronghold for pirates, and it became a thorn in the side of British merchant trade through the area. In 1718, Britain appointed Woods Rogers as governor of the Bahamas, and sent him at the head of a force to reclaim the settlement. Before his arrival, however, the pirates had been forced to surrender by a force of Bermudian privateers who had been issued letters of mark by the governor of Bermuda. Bermuda was in de facto control of the Turks Islands, with their lucrative salt industry, from the late 17th century to the early 19th. The Bahamas made perpetual attempts to claim the Turks for itself. On several occasions, this involved seizing the vessels of Bermudian salt traders. A virtual state of war was said to exist between Bermudian and Bahamian vessels for much of the 18th century. When the Bermudian sloop Seaflower was seized by the Bahamians in 1701, the response of the governor of Bermuda, Captain Benjamin Bennett, was to issue letters of marque to Bermudian vessels. In 1706, Spanish and French forces ousted the Bermudians, but were driven out themselves three years later by the Bermudian privateer Captain Louis Middleton. His ship, the Rose, attacked a Spanish and a French privateer holding a captive English vessel. Defeating the two enemy vessels, the Rose then cleared out the 30 man garrison left by the Spanish and French. Despite strong sentiments in support of the rebels, especially in the early stages, Bermudian privateers turned as aggressively on American shipping during the American War of Independence. The importance of privateering to the Bermudian economy had been increased not only by the loss of most of Bermuda's continental trade, but also by the Palliser Act, which forbade Bermudian vessels from fishing the Grand Banks. Bermudian trade with the rebellious American colonies actually carried on throughout the war. Some historians credit the large number of Bermuda sloops reckoned at over a thousand built in Bermuda as privateers and sold illegally to the Americans as enabling the rebellious colonies to win their independence. Also, the Americans were dependent on Turk salt, and 100 barrels of gunpowder were stolen from a Bermudian magazine and supplied to the rebels as orchestrated by Colonel Henry Tucker and Benjamin Franklin, and as requested by George Washington, in exchange for which the Continental Congress authorized the sale of supplies to Bermuda, which was dependent on American produce. The realities of this interdependence did nothing to dampen the enthusiasm with which Bermudian privateers turned on their erstwhile countrymen. An American naval captain, ordered to take his ship out of Boston Harbor to eliminate a pair of Bermudian privateering vessels that had been picking off vessels missed by the Royal Navy, returned frustrated, saying, the Bermudians sailed their ships two feet for every one of ours. Around 10,000 Bermudians emigrated in the years prior to American independence, mostly to the American colonies. 
Many Bermudians occupied prominent positions in American seaports, from where they continued their maritime trades Bermudian merchants controlled much of the trade through ports like Charleston, South Carolina, and Bermudian shipbuilders influenced the development of American vessels, like the Chesapeake Bay Schooner, and in the Revolution they used their knowledge of Bermudians and of Bermuda, as well well as their vessels, for the rebels' cause. In the 1777 Battle of Wreck Hill, brothers Charles and Francis Morgan, members of a large Bermudian enclave that had dominated Charleston, South Carolina and its environs since settlement, captaining two sloops the Fair American and the Experiment, respectively, carried out the only attack on Bermuda during the war. The target was a fort that guarded a little used passage through the encompassing reef line. After the soldiers manning the fort were forced to abandon it, they spiked its guns and fled themselves before reinforcements could arrive. When the Americans captured the Bermudian privateer regulator, they discovered that virtually all of her crew were black slaves. Authorities in Boston offered these men their freedom, but all seventy elected to be treated as prisoners of war. Sent as such to New York on the sloop Duxbury, they seized the vessel and sailed it back to Bermuda. The War of 1812 saw an encore of Bermudian privateering, which had died out after the 1790s. The decline of Bermudian privateering was due partly to the buildup of the naval base in Bermuda, which reduced the Admiralty's reliance on privateers in the western Atlantic, and partly to successful American legal suits and claims for damages pressed against British privateers, a large portion of which were aimed squarely at the Bermudians. During the course of the War of 1812, Bermudian privateers captured 298 ships, some 19% of the 1,593 vessels captured by British naval and privateering vessels between the Great Lakes and the West Indies. Amongst the better known native born and immigrant Bermudian privateers were Hezekiah Frith, Bridger Goodrich. Rich, Henry Jennings, Thomas Hewitson, and Thomas Tew. Topic Providence Island Colony Bermudians were also involved in privateering from the short-lived English colony on Isla de Providencia, off the coast of Nicaragua. This colony was initially settled largely via Bermuda, with about 80 Bermudians moved to Providence in 1631. Although it was intended that the colony be used to grow cash crops, its location in the heart of the Spanish-controlled territory ensured that it quickly became a base for privateering. Bermuda-based privateer Daniel Elfrith, while on a privateering expedition with Captain Sussex Kamek of the Bark Summer Islands a rendering of Summer's Isles, the alternate name of the islands of Bermuda in 1625, discovered two islands off the coast of Nicaragua, 80 kilometers 50 miles apart from each other. Kamek stayed with 30 of his men to explore one of the islands, San Andres, while Elfrith took the Warwick back to Bermuda bringing news of Providence Island. Bermuda Governor Bell wrote on behalf of Elfrith to Sir Nathaniel Rich, a businessman and cousin of the Earl of Warwick the namesake of Warwick Parish, who presented a proposal for colonizing the island noting its strategic location lying in the heart of the Indies and the mouth of the Spaniards. Elfrith was appointed Admiral of the Colony's military forces in 1631, remaining the overall military commander for over seven years. 
During this time, Elfrith served as a guide to other privateers and sea captains arriving in the Caribbean. Elfrith invited the well-known privateer Diego El Mulatto to the island. Samuel Axe, one of the military leaders, also accepted letters of mark from the Dutch authorizing privateering. The Spanish did not hear of the Providence Island colony until 1635, when they captured some Englishmen in Portobella, on the Isthmus of Panama. Francisco de Merga, governor and captain general of Cartagena, dispatched Captain Gregorio de Castellar y Mantilla and engineer Juan de Somuvilla Texada to destroy the colony. The Spanish were repelled and forced to retreat in haste and disorder. After the attack, King Charles I of England issued letters of mark to the Providence Island Company on 21 December 1635 authorizing raids on the Spanish in retaliation for a raid that had destroyed the English colony on Tortuga earlier in 1635. Tortuga had come under the protection of the Providence Island Company. In 1635 a Spanish fleet raided Tortuga. 195 colonists were hung and 39 prisoners and 30 slaves were captured. The company could in turn issue letters of marque to subcontracting privateers who used the island as a base, for a fee. This soon became an important source of profit. Thus the company made an agreement with the merchant Maurice Thompson under which Thompson could use the island as a base in return for 20% of the booty. In March 1636 the company dispatched Captain Robert Hunt on the blessing to assume the governorship of what was now viewed as a base for privateering. Depredations continued, leading to growing tension between England and Spain, which were still technically at peace. On the 11th of July 1640, the Spanish ambassador in London complained again, saying he understands that there is lately brought in at the Isle of Wight by one Captain James Reiskinner, James Reiskimmer, a ship very richly laden with silver, gold, diamonds, pearls, jewels, and many other precious commodities taken by him in virtue of a commission of of the said Earl of Warwick from the subjects of his Catholic Majesty, to the infinite wrong and dishonour of his Catholic Majesty, to find himself thus injured and violated, and his subjects thus spoiled, robbed, impoverished and murdered in the highest time of peace, league and amity with your Majesty. Nathaniel Butler, formerly governor of Bermuda, was the last full governor of Providence Island, replacing Robert Hunt in 1638. Butler returned to England in 1640, satisfied that the fortifications were adequate, deputizing the governorship to Captain Andrew Carter. In 1640, Don Melcher de Aguilera, governor and captain general of Cartagena, resolved to remove the intolerable infestation of pirates on the island. Taking advantage of having infantry from Castile and Portugal wintering in his port, he dispatched 600 armed Spaniards from the fleet and the Presidio, and 200 black and mulatto militiamen under the leadership of Don Antonio Maldonado y Tejada, his sergeant major, in six small frigates and a galleon. The troops were landed on the island, and a fierce fight ensued. The Spanish were forced to withdraw when a gale blew up and threatened their ships. Carter had the Spanish prisoners executed. When the Puritan leaders protested against this brutality, Carter sent four of them home in chains. 
The Spanish acted decisively to avenge their defeat. General Francisco Díaz Pimienta was given orders by King Philip IV of Spain, and sailed from Cartagena to Providence with seven large ships, four pinnaces, 1,400 soldiers and 600 seamen, arriving on 19 May 1641. At first Pimienta planned to attack the poorly defended east side, and the English rushed there to improvise defences. With the winds against him, Pimienta changed plans and made for the main New Westminster Harbour and launched his attack on 24 May. He held back his large ships to avoid damage, and used the pinnaces to attack the forts. The Spanish troops quickly gained control, and once the fort saw the Spanish flag flying over the governor's house, they began negotiations for surrender. On the 25th of May 1641, Pimienta formally took possession and celebrated mass in the church. The Spanish took 60 guns, and captured the 350 settlers who remained on the island, others had escaped to the Mosquito Coast. They took the prisoners to Cartagena. The women and children were given a passage back to England. The Spanish found gold, indigo, cochineal and 600 black slaves on the island, worth a total of 500,000 ducats, some of the accumulated booty from the English raids. Rather than destroy the defences, as instructed, Pimienta left a small garrison of 150 men to hold the island and prevent occupation by the Dutch. Later that year, Captain John Humphrey, who had been chosen to succeed Captain Butler as governor, arrived with a large group of dissatisfied settlers from New England. He found the Spanish in occupation. Pimienta's decision to occupy the island was approved in 1643 and he was made a Knight of the Order of Santiago. Spain and its colonies When Spain issued a decree blocking foreign countries from trading, selling or buying merchandise in its Caribbean colonies, the entire region became engulfed in a power struggle among the naval superpowers. The newly independent United States later became involved in this scenario, complicating the conflict. As a consequence, Spain increased the issuing of privateering contracts. These contracts allowed an income option to the inhabitants of these colonies that were not related to the Spanish conquistadores. The most well-known privateer corsairs of the 18th century in the Spanish colonies were Miguel Enriquez of Puerto Rico and José Campuzano Polanco of Santo Domingo. Miguel Enriquez was a Puerto Rican mulatto who abandoned his work as a shoemaker to work as a privateer. Such was the success of Enriquez, that he became one of the wealthiest men in the New World. His fleet was composed of approximately 300 different ships during a career that expanded 35 years, becoming a military asset and reportedly outperforming the efficiency of the Armada de Barlovento. Enriquez was knighted and received the title of Don from Philip V, something unheard of due to his ethnic and social background. One of the most famous privateers from mainland Spain was Amaro Pargo. <laughs> France 
Corsairs French, Corsair were privateers, authorized to conduct raids on shipping of a nation at war with France, on behalf of the French Crown. Seized vessels and cargo were sold at auction, with the Corsair captain entitled to a portion of the proceeds. Although not French Navy personnel, Corsairs were considered legitimate combatants in France and Allied nations, provided the commanding officer of the vessel was in possession of a valid letter of marque FR. Lettre de Marc or Lettre de Corse, and the officers and crew conducted themselves according to contemporary admiralty law. By acting on behalf of the French crown, if captured by the enemy, they could claim treatment as prisoners of war, instead of being considered pirates. Because corsairs gained a swashbuckling reputation, the word corsair is also used generically as a more romantic or flamboyant way of referring to privateers, or even to pirates. The Barbary pirates of North Africa as well as Ottomans were sometimes called Turkish Corsairs. <laughs> Malta Corsairing Italian, Corso, was an important aspect of Malta's economy when the island was ruled by the Order of St. John, although the practice had begun earlier. Corsairs sailed on privately owned ships on behalf of the Grand Master of the Order, and were authorized to attack Muslim ships, usually merchant ships from the Ottoman Empire. The Corsairs included Knights of the Order, native Maltese people, as well as foreigners. When they captured a ship, the goods were sold and the crew and passengers were ransomed or enslaved, and the Order took a percentage of the value of the booty. Corsairing remained common until the end of the 18th century. United States During the American Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress, and some state governments on their own initiative, issued privateering licenses, authorizing legal piracy, to merchant captains in an effort to take prizes from the British Navy and Tory loyalist privateers. This was done due to the relatively small number of commissioned American naval vessels and the pressing need for prisoner exchange. About 55,000 American seamen served aboard the privateers. They quickly sold their prizes, dividing their profits with the financier persons or company and the state colony. Long Island Sound became a hornet's nest of privateering activity during the American Revolution 1775 to 1783 as most transports to and from New York went through the Sound. New London, Connecticut was a chief privateering port for the American colonies, leading to the British Navy blockading it in 1778–1779. Chief financiers of privateering included Thomas and Nathaniel Shaw of New London and John McCurdy of Lyme. In the months before the British raid on New London and Groton, a New London privateer took Hannah in what is regarded as the largest prize taken by any American privateer during the war. Retribution was likely part of Governor Clinton's NY motivation for Arnold's raid, as the Hannah had carried many of his most cherished items. American privateers are thought to have seized up to 300 British ships during the war. The British ship Jack was captured and turned into an American privateer, only to be captured again by the British in the naval battle off Halifax, Nova Scotia. 
American privateers not only fought naval battles but also raided numerous communities in British colonies, such as the raid on Lunenburg, Nova Scotia The United States Constitution authorized the U.S. Congress to grant letters of marque and reprisal. Between the end of the Revolutionary War and 1812, less than 30 years, Britain, France, Naples, the Barbary States, Spain, and the Netherlands seized approximately 2,500 American ships. Payments in ransom and tribute to the Barbary States amounted to 20% of United States government annual revenues in 1800 and would lead the United States to fight the Barbary States in the First Barbary War and Second Barbary Wars. During the War of 1812, the British attacked Essex, Connecticut, and burned the ships in the harbour, due to the construction there of a number of privateers. This was the greatest financial loss of the entire War of 1812 suffered by the Americans. However, the private fleet of James de Wolfe, which sailed under the flag of the American government in 1812, was most likely a key factor in the naval campaign of the war. De Wolfe's ship, the Yankee, was possibly the most financially successful ship of the war. Privateers proved to be far more successful than their U.S. Navy counterparts, claiming three quarters of the 1,600 British merchant ships taken during the war although a third of these were recaptured prior to making landfall. One of the more successful of these ships was the Prince de Neufchâtel, which once captured nine British prizes in swift succession in the English Channel. Whilst apparently successful the privateer campaign was ultimately a failure. British convoy systems honed during the Napoleonic Wars limited losses to singleton ships, and the effective blockade of American and Continental ports prevented captured ships being taken in for sale. This ultimately led to orders forbidding U.S. privateers from attempting to bring their prizes into port, with captured ships instead having to be burnt. Over 200 American privateer ships were captured by the Royal Navy, many of which were turned on their former owners and used by the British blockading forces. Jean Lafitte and his privateers aided U.S. General Andrew Jackson in the defeat of the British in the Battle of New Orleans in order to receive full pardons for their previous crimes. Jackson formally requested clemency for Lafitte and the men who had served under him, and the U.S. government granted them all a full pardon on February 6, 1815. The U.S. was not one of the initial signatories of the 1856 Declaration of Paris which outlawed privateering, and the Confederate Constitution authorized use of privateers. However, the U.S. did offer to adopt the terms of the Declaration during the American Civil War, when the Confederates sent several privateers to sea before putting their main effort in the more effective commissioned raiders. During the Civil War Confederate President Jefferson Davis issued letters of marque to anyone who would employ their ship to either attack Union shipping or bring badly needed supplies through the Union blockade into southern ports. Many of the supplies brought into the Confederacy were carried aboard privately owned vessels. 
when word came about that the Confederacy was willing to pay almost any price for military supplies, various interested parties designed and built specially designed lightweight seagoing steamers, blockade runners specifically designed and built to outrun Union ships on blockade patrol. No letter of mark has been legitimately issued by the United States since the 19th century. The status of submarine hunting Goodyear airships in the early days of the Second World War has created significant confusion. According to one story, the United States Navy issued a letter of mark to the airship Resolute on the west coast of the United States at the beginning of World War II, making it the first time the U.S. Navy commissioned a privateer since the War of 1812. However, this story, along with various other accounts referring to the airships Resolute and Volunteer as operating under a privateer status, is highly dubious. Since neither the Congress nor the President appears to have authorized a privateer during the war, the Navy would not have had the authority to do so by itself. Latin America Warships were recruited by the insurgent governments during Spanish-American Wars of Independence to destroy Spanish trade, and capture Spanish merchant vessels. The private armed vessels came largely from the United States. Seamen from Britain, United States and France often manned these ships. <laughs> See also